So I want to consider contemporary ways of imagining the planetary today, focusing on the connection between what I think is an ongoing revolution in the Earth sciences, climate disruption, and some modes of visualization that link them all together. In the United States, a common way to tell the history of the planetary is to evoke the Apollo programs and the photographs looking back at the Earth, a series of spectacular images in the late 1960s and early 70s that led to a new kind of public consciousness, personified in guides to alternative living, like the whole Earth catalog, and then codified with the creation of Earth Day in 1970, and soon thereafter with the passage of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts and the EPA itself. These moments are indeed culturally powerful and iconic, but the planetary I would like to suggest today is uh, one, a formation that emerges in the global north out of 20th century industrial toxicity, following on Depeche and Anne's conversations, and the specific uh, scientific infrastructures that were built to measure and study that toxicity. And two, that it remains largely an anticipatory form that people do not yet have a planetary social order or even a means, uh, a true uh, mode of planetary thought. So I wanna to consider today what it means to discover the environment primarily through injury and loss and to comment on some important political blockages to contemporary thought about the emergent planetary. We could begin to problematize the planetary via the mid-century U.S. thermonuclear detonations in the Pacific. These unprecedentedly violent events lifted radionuclides, notably plutonium, strontium, and cesium, into the upper atmosphere, where wind currents distributed them all around the world. This was part of an emergent new security regime in the mid-20th century. Atmospheric scientists soon studied these particles, tracking them and using them for a vast range of tracer studies, which inaugurated an ongoing scientific revolution on planet Earth, one that would transform Earth science itself, leading into vast new technical infrastructures for studying earthly conditions. As scientists tracked radionuclides as they move through air, water, land, and ultimately through the food chain, the, the modern idea of ecology itself was established in the mid-50s, linking all organisms in an integrated biosphere. This is from Mashta, List, and Hubert study from 1956, tracking the fallout from that pre previous video clip. Similar work on petrochemical pollution, alongside Rachel Carson's warning about the ecological effects of DDT, produced a documented world of industrial injury, where pollution was transforming the conditions of possibility for life in measurable ways. And this is from George Woodwell's 1967 uh, article on toxic subjects and ecological cycles, which was studying both strontium, also from that earlier nuclear detonation, and DDT through uh, a set of ecological relations, talking about the particular counts in different species. As these scientists expanded the scope and range of their tracer studies through the 60s and 70s, the only way to visualize the scale of pollution was literally from off-world, wor off raising important questions about the temporality of industrial violence as mid-20th mid century forms of toxicity in the form of both fallout and also now greenhouse gases are continuing to shape earthly conditions in the 21st century and beyond. It also raises the ethical problem of how nuclear testing and carbon emissions from the global north impact all areas of planet Earth, including both non-nuclear states and, of course, those vast number of communities that have always had very low carbon emissions. Uh, so toxicity in these forms is both collective and unequally distributed around the world, uh, concentrating in some bodies more than others, affecting all to a degree, but some with much more intensity following Anne's comment. The continued expansion of sensing arrays for environmental conditions uh, throughout the Cold War and into the post-Cold War period were also direct, directly linked in many ways to the infrastructures for nuclear war fighting. By the end of the 20th century, a global set of sensors across air, water, and land were deployed to account and look for any possible nuclear detonations. 
Uh, and this is a chart from the international organization uh, looking for uh, both uh, supporting nuclear treaties, but also looking for nuclear tests. And what you have here is the integrated set of sensors for air, on water, and in land, an emergent global data set in the making. Uh, linking to these arrays are now a vast set of uh, sensors measuring climactic conditions and observing other uh, changes in aspects of the Earth system. So the point is, out of nuclear nationalism comes this explosion in the Earth sciences, looking for many, many different kinds of data and bringing them together in new ways. Uh, integrating redundant technologies on land, in air, and increasingly in outer space. This is another way we get to the planetary. Uh, this is a uh, recent visualization from NASA of its key environmental sensing satellites. So these are all networked and now redundant technical arrays that enable increasingly sophisticated data and also in, uh, increasingly sophisticated visualizations of earthly conditions. This is a new mode of communication that I think will be increasingly powerful across the 21st century in conveying the problems of massive complexity, massive historical depth, and drawing on the historic uh, combination of data across many different kinds of uh, environmental uh, information. Here, for instance, is a recent uh, NASA simulation of one year of carbon in the atmosphere, which was made by the Scientific Visualization Studio at the Goddard Space Flight Center, which has been pioneering a kind of uh, filmic-based visualization or animation uh, style to mobilize uh, complex big data sets into modes of public communication. This representation mobilizes global data sets to present a temporal slice of, of a planetary condition. And this ongoing revolution in the earth science is increasingly working via global data sets to represent the past, the present, and the future conditions on earth. So uh, it would seem to be a vital and even in increasingly commonplace register of a planetary mode of thinking. A depiction of changes in atmospheric chemistry in this case, or we could also show uh, similar uh, uh, animations of polar ice loss or of heat or of storms. And we are indeed in the midst of many, many different kinds of claims on the planetary, many which are now also starting to promise uh, modes of governance at absolute scale. And uh, in previous work that I've been interested in uh, watching and talking about the uh, evolution of the counterterrorist state in the US after 2001, one key aspect of that massive expansion in the security regime coming out of the US was to try to imagine working at ultimate scale. As we sit here, the, you know, the, the U.S. is uh, maintaining its 800 military bases. It's got special operation forces in over 130 countries doing something and is involved in many military uh, events around the world that have zero uh, kind of uh, attention in uh, contemporary media. All of that is straining to get to a planetary uh, kind of formation, even if it misses that, uh, that scale. But let's look at a few others. Here is a slide from the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, offering a possible governan governance model for earthly conditions, looking at the planetary boundaries, the specific domains that are responsible for maintaining life on Earth in its uh, current formation, looking for uh, intensities that exceed the boundaries for maintaining life as it uh, developed in the Holocene, and then seeking to build out governance mechanisms that could control things like ocean acidification, uh, land system change, biosphere integrity. Um, and I would just note in the upper right, there's also the novel entities, which is the great thing about this chart, which is the unknown part of how you might engage uh, doing a planetary governance of the environment. But we could also look at other uh, new modes of uh, suggested planetary governance. Uh, this is uh, the cover of The Economist on its planetary health issue. Planetary health is a evolution from the past 20 years of global health. Uh, planetary health also includes animals and plants. 
and is um, trying to imagine a integrated space for thinking about health across species. Or we could go back to NASA in relationship to the DOD and look at their uh, newly formed Department of Planetary Defense, which is interested in trying to come up with scenarios for avoiding uh, or dealing with asteroid strikes. It currently has one planetary defense officer. So there is one person responsible for all planetary defenses. Um, and we wish him well. Um, <laughs> OK, so despite these highly interesting and well-meaning efforts, I'd like to suggest that the planetary remains highly distinct from the global and that most of what I've shown comes out of global infrastructures. The global is an engineered space made up of the infrastructures, data, finance, and uh, militarism. The planetary references uh, the totality of life and substance on Earth, and this complexity still defies representation, and it is also at odds with processes like nuclear nationalism and petrochemical capitalism that can affect life on the scale of the planet, but that uh, support very narrow nation state and corporate interests. Indeed, and there's a kind of parallel story to the history that I've uh, sketched out today, which is of a kind of counter revolution to environmental science itself, uh, involving both the continued expansion of nuclear nationalism and also of petrochemical capitalism, despite the ever increasingly and well-documented uh, and monumental scale of environmental destruction caused by these activities. So uh, the United States has committed uh, in recent years, both in the Obama administration and now in the Trump administration, to commit some $2 trillion to building the nuclear complex anew, brand new nuclear complex for the 21st century, trying to maintain it out through the end of uh, the year 2100. Similarly, the Trump administration has, ways, have, has waged a most serious war on environmental science itself, uh, unpacking uh, data resources at places like the EPA, uh, dismantling regulatory boards of scientists, using uh, appointment powers and funding to basically try to dismantle the state that we usually think of emerged immediately out of those Apollo mission photographs of a planet that needs some kind of protection. And so there is a very real question today about what kind of environmental governments, governance will uh, remain after uh, the next couple of years. So in this light, I want to question the vitality of a concept of the planetary that only emerges out of injury, out of tracing toxicities of various kinds through the Earth's system and various bodies and with various concentrations, uh, and making such vibrant calculations of when the damage hits the inflection point. The whole point of pollution as it has emerged uh, in the second half of the 20th century is the point has not been to stop the pollution, but to judge at what point it matters. And we're now in a, in a regime where that is not the, uh, the uh, frame that can solve any kind of existing problems. Um, this is the story of the past half century of environmental science in which increasingly precise depictions of changing earthly conditions, intensifying storms, droughts, and fires, shrinking ice caps and rising oceans, accelerating biodiversity loss and extinction rates have proliferated with an accompanying proliferation of visualization technologies and anticipations of worsening conditions. And this gets at some of the kind of affective concerns that Anne was talking about. At what point does the cataclysmic do some actual work? And at what point are you rehearsing a uh, pretty uh, well-worn uh, mode of thinking? Uh, so thinking the planetary requires an as yet undeveloped mode of radical relationality across geographical space, across species relations, and with a new sense of the temporality of industrial toxicity as it continues to unfold into a distant future. All of the things I've shown you here from carbon to the plutonium exposures from that, uh, that early 1952 uh, nuclear detonation continue to move through the Earth system continue to move through bodies and will continue to do so into the indefinite future. And that test from 1952 is um, the plutonium from its dispersal into the global environment is one of the key contenders geologists are thinking about for anchoring a mid 20th century Anthropocene uh, using 
the, uh, the, the interest in finding a exposure at planetary scale that's also an artificial marker of human activity. This would fold nuclear nationalism into geological time in a completely new way. We would no longer be in the nuclear age or the Anthropocene would be the nuclear age. I mean, these things are collapsing in on each other in a very interesting way conceptually. Uh, and the question is, what does it mean in the, in, for right now? But I'd like to suggest that a positive planetary relation would entail not only responsibility for contemporary conditions, but also for deep future ones, a mode of responsibility and relationality that remains extremely difficult to conceptualize. And I'd like to end that by suggesting that the planetary, despite the proliferation of global data sets and the increasingly compelling scientific visualizations of earthly conditions that promise access to the planetary, remain a kind of not yet condition, an anticipatory form that requires expanding ethical relations on radical spatial and temporal scales. And I think it's ultimately to reimagine property relations and to reimagine a mode of political thought that's not organized by the violent global assumptions of either petrochemical capitalism or nuclear nationalism, which each rely on specific forms of territoriality. Thank you. <laughs>